Okay, um, so hello everyone. Welcome to this online policy dialogue organized by the European Policy Center in the framework of the Election Monitor, which is an EPC flagship initiative to monitor national elections across Europe and analyze their results as, as well as their implications for the EU. I am Berta Lopez. I'm, I'm a junior policy analyst at the EPC following the Western Balkans and EU enlargement. And today we will zoom into the SNAP Serbian parliamentary elections that took place um, yesterday. With almost 47% of the votes, SNS, the party of the president Alexander Vucic, and which is in power since um, 2012, has won the election, followed by the opposition coalition Serbia Against Violence with 23% um, of the votes, and uh, the Socialist Party of Serbia, um, the current uh, junior uh, coalition partner of SNS, with 6.7% um, of the vote. Uh, the election were uh, called last October by President Alexander Vucic following months of continuing demonstrations in Belgrade and across the whole country under the name Serbia Against um, Violence that started after two mass shootings uh, that took place in early May and that killed 19 people, many of them uh, were kids. Um, as I said, the protests adopted the name of Serbia Against Violence and accused the government of spreading uh, a culture of violence that enabled for the shootings uh, to take place. Um, the protests were organized by several opposition parties that for the first time have run together in a coalition, in a, in a single list in yesterday's uh, election. This um, have been the fifth parliamentary elections that have taken place since SNS came to power in 2012. And yesterday, in addition to the to the election at the at the National Assembly, um, there were also elections taking place at the Assembly of the Autonomous Autonomous Province of Vojvodina and in several cities and municipalities, including uh, the capital uh, Belgrade. Um, these elections have taken place in a political environment in Serbia that has been uh, increasingly deteriorate, deteriorating in the past years, as many um, reports um, confirm. Uh, the, com the country's democratic standards have backslided, um, rule of law has been undermined, and uh, several government officials have been involved in corruption and organized crime. There have been increasing con uh, gov governmental control of the media sector and great political influence of the um, judiciary. As a result of uh, all of this, um, during these past years, Serbia's path towards the EU has been uh, fraught with several challenges. Uh, apart from the country's increasing illiberalism and decline in, in rule of law and, and fundamental um, rights standards, Serbia's close ties to Russia and its failure to align uh, to the, with the um, Union's common foreign and security policy has uh, have deemed um, Serbia's um, European, European prospects. Uh, furthermore, the lack of progress in the normalization of relations between Belgrade and Pristina has further complicated Serbia's ability to advance towards the EU. Um, in this context, the public support for the for EU membership has um, shrinked, with less than 50% of the Serbian population supporting uh, EU membership. Um, and in this context, to help us understand the results of uh, yesterday's elections uh, in Serbia and to understand as well their significance at the EU level, I am joined today by four outstanding um, speakers. Uh, Sergeant Zbijic, um, he's the president, president of the International Advisory Committee of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy. Alexandra Tomanic, uh, she is the executive director of the European Fund for, for the Balkans. Strahina Subotic, um, he's a senior researcher at the European Policy Center in Belgrade and the manager of the Our uh, Europe program in ATSEP. And finally, Sasha eh, Dragoilo, who is a, Bal a Belgrade-based journalist uh, for Balkan uh, Inside, and he's also author of a documentary, Right and More to the Right, about service far right, which I really recommend you watching if you're interested in the topic. So um, uh, welcome uh, all of you, and thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate in this uh, panel discussion. I will start with an exchange with you, with the panelists, and then I will open the floor for questions uh, from, from the audience. Um, yeah, I take the opportunity to... to to encourage uh, the audience to to take part in the in the discussion and put their questions either in written form in the Q and A box um, during at any point during the discussion or if you prefer you can raise your digital hand and I will give you the floor when the time comes. 
And, and yeah, and with that, I would uh, like to, to start by asking the, the four of you, um, what is um, your reading of the results, whether um, you were expecting the election outcome, uh, what are the factors explaining the results, um, et cetera. And I would maybe um, start giving the floor to a surgeon uh, and then we will go to, to the others of you. Thank you very much, uh, Berta, and thank you for inviting me to European Policy Center as well uh, to address um, this online um, uh, meeting, well, uh, event. Uh, I must, as a disclaimer, say that I'm extremely tired because I haven't slept the whole night since, apart from my <laughs> regular think tank job, I have been a controller in these elections as well. So um, I'm basically just coming back from the local electoral commission a couple of hours ago. So, uh, well, there are several ways to read these elections. I would say, uh, you know, you probably read uh, um, in the news uh, some news titles uh, refer to them as a referendum for and against Vucic. And I would think that this is um, uh, slightly an oversimplification. I would call these elections a battle for the silent majority, for the undecided voters. And in that battle, I think uh, uh, the opposition <laughs> won probably, but the Pyrrhus victory. And uh, and uh, here is uh, the results, and uh, I will try to explain why I say this. Because basically, SNS managed even to Vucic's party managed even to increase, despite the protests that you have mentioned and the extremely uh, unfavorable climate to him after the mass shootings in May, to increase his uh, parliamentary seats. Now we don't know with utmost accuracy, but from 120 in the 2022 elections to 128 in these. Uh, Serbian parliament has 20, 250 parliamentary seats, which means that Vucic alone, um, against all odds, managed to uh, secure the absolute majority in the parliament, 50% plus one. Now, uh, this has to be read in, a, in another way. Did Vucic manage to win over the undecided voters? No, I would say no. Vucic mainly managed to win over the voters of the Socialist Party and maybe of some right-wing coalitions. And there are people here like Sasha who can talk much more about uh, the nature of these coalitions and that uh, than myself. But uh, uh, Socialist Party of Serbia, which has been the long longstanding uh, coalition partner of Vucic since the 1990s, I would say, uh, uh, lost uh, uh, 13 parliamentary seats from 31 to 18, which has been probably the worst result for them since 2006. Their president uh, announced that he would uh, step down, which I highly doubt would happen. But uh, that 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 was the what was said at the press conference. Uh, so I think Vucic mainly managed to win thanks to stealing the votes from the socialists. And uh, this is uh, how the campaign went, really, as well, from the very start. You know, probably from the Brussels perspective, what you have in mind is Kosovo, EU integration, uh, alignment with Chapter 31. Well, none of this was a salient topic in these elections. Uh, the, 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 what people, uh, all the campaign was about change, fear of change, uh, that has been the main light motive of the campaign of the ruling party. So, you know, if you don't vote for us, things will go bad. They will be like prior to 2012, you know, when they weren't in power, so centered on economy and so on and so forth. The opposition, on the other hand, managed to increase their parliamentary seats by 14. So from 51 to 65, most probably. I mean, these are not final results. We don't know. And uh, there, I would say... Why a Pyrrhus victory? Well, you know, uh, the coalition against violence that you mentioned uh, won in 2022 uh, about 762,000 votes. Now they went to over 900,000, 900,013, which was still, as we can see, not enough for victory. It was not enough for victory in Belgrade. 
the results in Belgrade are uh, as, you know, probably as uh, they were last time, just with a slight shift on the minor parties that made, that made it to the city assembly. But all this, and maybe I will stop here if you don't want me to talk about the, the, the actual nature of the electoral process that I can refer to later. All this is as we are talking about elections in Spain or in Belgium. These are not elections like in Spain in Belgium. Elections in Serbia are like the elections in Hungary, in er er Erdogan's Turkey. They're not democratic and free and fair elections. There is no uh, um, uh, level playing, playing field for all the participants. The elections, to put it very bluntly, are not stolen on the day, as we could see, and we can delve more into that later, but even before these elections. So just to use a metaphor, uh, these elections, when it comes to Vucic's party and the opposition, are as if I would go in a boxing match against Mike Tyson, myself. And uh, not only that I would fight against an unequal enemy, but Mike Tyson's fans would hit me all along the way to the ring, his trainer and assistants during the match, and him actually just being uh, vastly superior to myself. So these are the elections, and they bring a great dilemma that I would uh, not talk about now, but we can come back to it all together later, is whether it's even possible to win in these elections in competitive authoritarian regimes. There are a big dilemma for the opposition in Serbia, in other countries with similar systems. And, uh, you know, um, if you would ask me and probably... Uh, the opposition leaders beforehand, before the elections. We can also talk about their reactions um, to everything what happened, if you would ask me before. Uh, there is always this optimism and my willingness to participate. I would probably say yes. Now I would tell you no. And I think most of them as well, because what they're doing now is they're calling for protests. Maybe it's a little too late, but... Uh, you know, we can discuss about that later as well. I would stop here for the introduction. Thank you. Um, I would follow up with a question and maybe um, address it to, to Strahinja. Um, in fact, the, the polls before um, the elections were giving, so we're giving the victory to SNS, but we're giving up way better results to the opposition. I think that it was up to 26%. And uh, they were giving way less um, votes for the for SNS. I think it was around 39. And in the end, like to compare it, it has been 47 and 23. Um, why um, do you think that the that the polls haven't matched or the, the, the final results haven't matched the expectations? Um, is it just for the so as we saw yesterday, several uh, fraud attempts like the arena? a scandal with people from Republika Srpska uh, coming to vote or people from outside of Brussels coming, uh, Belgrade coming to vote at the Belgrade elections, not Brussels. Um, I would uh, ask Astrahinia, is the result only um, a result of the of the fraud or there are other um, explanations for this uh, mismatch um, of the expectations and the final results? I lost you completely when you mentioned my name, actually. So, so sorry, uh, I would kindly ask you to repeat the question I, I will because the internet froze. I I was um saying so. I'm asking you about like your reading of the results and and with a follow up question, which is, uh, why do you think that the results haven't matched uh the opinion polls that were giving a uh, better uh results for the um opposition um Serbia against violence and worse results for SNS. And 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 yeah, why do you okay, think yeah. if if you think that this um this difference has been only due to um fraud or there are all, all other reasons um explaining this difference between uh polls and actual uh results? Okay, thank you for the question or questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say when uh, this electoral campaign uh, started, we at uh, first we're not sure when the elections would take place now or spring sooner or later. But it was a fact that the environment was more unfavorable, at least to my reading, to the ruling party than the previous environments, environments during the previous uh, electoral cycles. 
the ruling party was actually facing multiple uncertainties, which it had not foreseen before. For example, as you know, we had multiple protests since May. Uh, then we had a counter protest, which was also seen uh, to look as a failure because the government really ba barely struggled to send the message that this is the biggest protest in history of Serbia. Nobody was, I believe, convinced by this. Uh, thirdly, then uh, we had a number of affairs that have shown that the government was a bit paranoid and panicking and therefore taking missteps along the way. And in addition, we had uh, uh, some of the party members leaving the party. All of this showcasing that uh, the SNS, the ruling party, has uh, passed its prime. That was the uh, sense. It was the strongest party. Everybody knew it would have about 40. But still, the sense was that the, uh, it's still not at the peak. It was decreasing slowly but surely. And uh, having this in mind, this was uh, something that made the elections uh, more interesting to follow and maybe gave more energy to position uh, to fight. However, seeing these results, I can say that actually uh, the personality cult of Vucic seems to be issue proof. So regardless of the number of issues, the number of controversies, the number of unfavorable environment uh, elements, he still decisively won. So this led me to think about two things. Uh, firstly, it is true that, of course, we don't have a level playing field. The elections are not fair or were not fair. Uh, of course, there were instances that questioned the freedom of choice also during the elections. However, I'm afraid that uh, uh, even without these elements of unfair and uh, unfree elections, I think he would have still uh, won them uh, quite uh, uh, surely. Before, that would not have been the case after 2012, because it ne needed to take time to poison our society and to build this uh, cult, uh, uh, per uh, personality cult. But now, let's imagine we have 100% free and fair elections. I'm not convinced that this would be enough to uh, overthrow Vucic and uh, have a, a strong, democratic, forceful push by the from within at the society, because I think now it's too late. It seems that whatever happens is, as I mentioned, cult is uh, uh, issue proof. And this also uh, is important from the perspective of collective consciousness, consciousness, I believe. This is sociological, maybe psychological perspective. But it seems to me that the key word here is fear. That the fear has entered the skin of majority of citizens here, fear of losing a job fear of alternative, fear of a fragmented uh, political future, fear of future without Vucic. So for them, no matter the number of issues, no matter what he does with Kosovo, they might love him or hate him completely, uh, the alternative is always worse. And therefore, this goes to a level of subconscious, I believe, would say, after having the unlevel, uh, un uneven playing field for the past 10 decades, for the past 10 years, even if we have fair, fair, free and fair elections, I think the subconscious element would kick in uh, with uh, many people here in Serbia. And that's why uh, I believe that uh, Vucic will do his best to uh, sustain this fear uh, all the way to presidential elections in 2027. For me, 2027 is actually the potential uh, critical juncture. Uh, History changes in Serbian presidential elections, not parliamentary. So in that sense, uh, this is a, a, the next big uh, critical juncture because Vucic can't run for the third term. Of course, he would run for president, but still, the SNS party doesn't have an electable person besides Vucic. So I saw these elections as a stepping stone to those presidential elections. I expect them to start grooming somebody new or dig somebody from the past, such as maybe Thomas Nikolic, and build up even more this fear as to have successful 2027, or in other words, a whole new decade of uh, the ruling party uh, uh, governance. I'll end here and I give the floor back to you. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. This is um, yeah, in really interesting analysis. Um, so um, you were saying that like the that SNS and 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 Vucic in general, because in the end, like it has been like Vucic who has been like the face, even if he was not running for 
for uh, for a post. Um, he has been like overall part of the campaign um, that have been playing with um, with this fear of like what will happen if um, he's not there. I am wondering if this uh, means that the opposition, despite getting together and 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 forming a, a single um, list, have failed or have not not succeeded in uh, providing an alternative, or whether this alternative is not realistic enough for um for part of the of of Serbian um citizens. I would maybe um now uh, go to um Sasha and with this uh question like reading of the results and and the role of the oppositions of the opposition um whether um they have so did well or they it has been like a, a, the right choice for them to run together and whether you think that they have succeeded in 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 their 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 um uh yeah willingness to, to present an alter, alter, alternative to to Bucic. uh yes well i agree with most of the things my colleagues previously said but i think this question you pose is is the key question i think that uh, beside the Vucic, which is the major issue for the serbian society the second one very close to Vucic is serbian opposition so i think that uh, the state of serbian opposition is the reason why Vucic is so successful in general, because I think the the how uh, opposition is shaped ideologically with the narratives they used, it's a perfect uh, enemy for for uh, SNS and for Vucic. And uh, before these elections, I these results did not surprise me. Some lists surprised me, such as uh, Doctor Nestorovic, of course, that was a, a major surprise. Uh, also, I did not expect uh, such a uh, big downfall of socialists. But everything else, it's uh, quite exactly as I expected. So the major opposition list, uh, Serbia Against Violence, I think they made so many mistakes uh, in this uh, process. I think they they had uh, uh, practically, they, they did not have a, a campaign. They had a, a non-existing campaign uh, which increased in the last week. They did not have videos, they did not have billboards. Did not, they did not even put faces on those billboards. Uh, they uh, choose a um, mayor who is widely unknown. So uh, the campaign is like a photo finish of, you know, like a propaganda of the political parties. And you need to be more visible than ever. So because uh, regular people who are not into politics, when there is election, they will follow something. But uh, Serbia against violence decided to go like uh, you know low. Uh, I think that's the reason. One of the reasons for that is that the major leader of that coalition is Dragan Gilas, and he is a pretty unpopular face uh, 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 due to the uh, ruling party propaganda against him. So uh, it suited him that this campaign doesn't have big figures and doesn't have faces. Uh, and I think that was a really big mistake for this coalition. Uh, the second, the second thing I, I think it's even more important than this one is that this coalition uh, does not go out of the 20, 25 percent bubble of urban middle class uh, voters. And this is the problem we have for years. They always do the same things. They uh, approach to the same people. Uh, previously, we had uh, nine different political options who want to take the same voters now we have a coalition and they they got it they got that pool of voters that's existing in serbia but if you want to tackle Vucic's regime you need to enter his uh, voters you need to persuade his voters that he's not an option for them anymore and they did not succeed in doing this for a, a decade already they did not consolidate uh, options uh, to, to tackle him. Also uh, about the referendum atmosphere that was created. This is something also that the opposition is doing for years, you know, uh, against Vucic. He is a dictator, authoritarian leader. He is destroying this society. Uh, but the situation is not like in 2000s when we overthrow Slobodan Milosevic. It's completely different political context, but they still use the same narratives. Uh, in 2000, uh, Serbia was... Uh, came in out of the war, uh, NATO bombing, uh, uh, isolation of the world, uh, sanctions, economic poverty and everything. Uh, but um, 
uh, we uh, people had a project they would follow and saw the alternative but now uh, people uh, as previous colleagues mentioned they don't see any alternative now uh, after Vucic what will they get they were betrayed so many times especially the poor people of, of Serbia who are um, uh, in majority voting for Vucic because of uh, the pure interests uh, they get and fear because they know that whoever comes to power their uh, social situation will not slightly change and the opposition the major opposition uh, parties from Serbia against violence they did not even you they did not have a, a, a socio-economic topic in this campaign uh, the campaign was Vucic and that is something that really suits Vucic as Strahinja mentioned because his image is the the biggest thing he has, the biggest resource, uh, by the way. So basically, uh, you, uh, the people in Serbia will not uh, accept anymore, you know, uh, to vote against someone, at least not at this point. They want to vote for something. And none of these parties uh, give any major project, uh, anything to, to offer to voters. And they uh, uh, continue to do that from... Uh, from election process to election process. Uh, and uh, also these elections in, uh, in uh, December, uh, 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 the opposition asks for that. I think that everybody who is following the political scene in Serbia, I know how the state of the opposition infrastructure is and who talks with them unofficially, they were not ready for this. They lost so many much energy to make a coalition probably and they did not uh, have a, a resources uh, a or a quality organization to, to fight Vucic, who has uh, millions of euros, uh, state resources, and uh, all so sorts of black funds who are being used for this campaign, for bribery, for uh, hiring people to work for him. So basically, uh, as uh, Strahinja mentioned, I think at uh, this point, 2027 is a project year that they need to all accept. He will be there until 2027. They should, you know, make program coalitions and uh, try to offer people something more than just voting against Vucic. And this is the last opportunity for that because uh, they cannot uh, run a campaign with Vucic every year. They are exhausted after every election uh, process, but and Vucic is not. He's enjoying that. He is a, a professional when it comes to a campaign. Uh, this is how he mobilizes his party structures. So th that is something that they need to work on. And I think these are the, are the key issues for the Serbian opposition. And uh, uh, also, uh, uh, one thing I will mention, I will finish with, uh, with this uh, segment. Uh, the old figures from the previous democratic uh, uh, party who ruled the, the country before SNS, uh, they are so unpopular and satanized by the, the ruling majority, uh, uh, even 10 years later, that those people will never be the you know, leaders of the change here. We saw that the party of uh, Boris Tadic, former president, his list is under the threshold, Vuk Jeremic also, uh, he's uh, under the threshold, so I think that these people cannot be uh, uh, vouching to be any leaders in the future. Also, I think in Serbia against violence, they need to take responsibility for these results and to see what will they do and who can be the, uh, the leader of some changes and to prepare for the elections in four years. Uh, so, and uh, I, I did not mention all these unlevel conditions, uh, fraud, uh, use of state resources because people already mentioned that is the uh, uh, key issue but uh, that will not change nobody will help them but th themselves basically thank you sasha i'm um, yeah you were mentioning that like well you i think that um surgeon also mentioned it that the deadline um is um 2027 so um, I would now like to move to uh, Alexandra and ask her about the reading of the results and whether uh, you think it would be possible or it should be ideal that the coalition, the opposition, manages to get together until 2027, because I am I am wondering whether it will be possible to remain at the like in the opposition. So many different parties with different uh, 
uh, affiliations uh, that have gathered together now for a really concrete um, objective, which was like, um, you know, like beating uh, SNS and Vucic, whether it will be possible that this coalition remains united and without internal clashes until 2027. Um, so yeah, Alexandra, over uh, to you. Also, if you want to um, explain a little bit um, the context in which these elections have taken place regarding the protest uh, and and so on, uh, you are uh, more, more than welcome. Thank you. Well, yes, you mentioned the protest. So just briefly, we had two mass shootings in May, which brought uh, hundreds of thousands of people for weeks across Serbia into the streets. Uh, under the headline Serbia against violence. This was then taken up by the opposition to unite under this headline. Um, the opposition saw these protests as a political crisis and, as Sasha said, asked for snap elections. And I think that here we have just a different perception of reality. While the opposition saw that as an opportunity and as a political crisis, I'm quite sure that Vucic and his party absolutely would not agree that that was such a case, because only a few years ago, he even said, even if it's five millions of you in the streets, I, I couldn't care less. So I think that he, in the end, gave in to this opposition demand to having snap election was only to like put the attention from the Banska attack in North Kosovo to elections because like nobody's talking about Banska consequences and so on any longer. We are here to analyze elections, which I would doubt deserve that name. Uh, I think that we should be sure that, especially when speaking about snap elections on any level, that they wouldn't be called if Vucic wouldn't be 100% sure to have the mechanism to get them. So this naive optimism, which I also wanted to believe um, that anything is possible, was, as I said, naive. We knew I'm living in a part of Belgrade where a few years ago Vucic managed for the first time to get um, the majority and the, 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 the mechanisms were exactly the same like now for Belgrade. Thousands of phantom voters being put there to, to vote. So even that mechanism and the buses, you mentioned the arena and so on, even that was nothing new. But again, I think that the opposition there was really like not really very well prepared. I somehow tend to have an extra buffer of understanding for the opposition. I think it takes a lot of courage to be politically active in a country like Serbia. It's dangerous. It's a lot of threats. And I, I really think that they deserve an extra un part of understanding and, and, and maybe constructive um, adding and criticism there. The question is how much have they been supported also from abroad? I mean, the crisis of democracy, and I think we should stop calling Serbia democracy at the latest after yesterday. The inter it was internationally recognized at the latest 2019 when a delegation of the European Parliament came to mediate to improve conditions. Literally nothing has happened since then. In 2020, big parts of the opposition even boycotted the elections. And still, in 20, the 2020 elections, the uh, congratulations to free and fair elections came from the very top of the EU. So the opposition is literally forced to add and to play this game with a huge disbalance of resources. And I don't only mean media access. Within the last 45 days, the president was on national TV for over 40. I mean, Sirta has data on that. We always speak about captured state, but what that, does that mean? It's political corruption, and corruption means black money. So the resources are unlimited. People are very poor here, and they're politically uneducated. So they will sell you know, their vote. And again, it's not the people to be blamed. It's, it's other other um, things that, that have to be looked into. So it was the campaigning, like also a resource thing and an organizational thing completely uneven, the voters buying, the media access, and last but not least, the functionaires campaign. I mean, even the prime minister yesterday thanked the president for being uh, the carrier of their list as being a president. And I did also like voter animation in my neighborhood. And I was asked on set Saturday evening by a neighbor, well, but who is actually running for the opposition in the presidential election? So that's the level of understanding of like ordinary people outside of our bubble. 
Um, the voter turnout, despite the campaign and despite the big protests and so on, was, was just marginally bigger than in previous elections. So basically, it was the same. I think that's something we have to look into and how we animate those almost 40% of people that just don't participate in political decision making. Maybe they're more honest than us. I mean, we do participate and we speak about elections, but as, again, we need a new term for this, what, what happened um, last last night. Um, and I would like also to raise one issue that hasn't been mentioned so far. Last night, we also saw very openly um, the Serbian world on stage of the ruling party with the uh, president of the Republika Srpska Dodik just behind Vucic. We saw the speaker of the Montenegrin parliament and many other high level functionaries. So I think that this is also something that has to be looked into. And before I finish, um, I would really like to thank Sergen personally as a voter. Uh, thanks to Sergen for being there as a controller and to Katarina, my colleague from the office, and to the many thousand observers because they were there on the front lines. Many of them, especially in smaller towns, were really, they were physically attacked. They were beaten up. They were treated threatened and i mean this is uh, this is a personal decision you take so uh all these people who were there in the front line to defend what's left of serbian democracy they they deserve a big thank you and we we have one of them today with us here thank you indeed uh thank you alexandra and 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 i will now um give the floor to surgeon because uh indeed i want him to um explain a bit more how was it um like he was uh, as you said a, a controller from the um, in the in the um, in the school, so I will want to ask him how it was. And also, you mentioned something that I also wanted to bring in, which is um, the fact that yesterday um, Bucic was accompanied by Milorad Dodik and Andrea Mandic uh, and and other uh, Serb leaders from uh, across the Balkans. And um, with this, I will bring it to together um, with a question from um, Dragan Sojovic, who's the um, who's from the uh, Mission of Serbia to the EU in Brussels. Um, he is asking uh, for all of you, how uh, all of you see the future links and relations between Belgrade and Banja Luka, particularly having in mind the latest decision of the um, UCO regarding not opening negotiations with Bosnia. So we um, first go with Surgeon for the uh, insights from, from the field, and then we will move on uh, the implications of the results for the for the Serbia's EU accession process and, and for the Western Balkans uh, in general. So, uh, Sergen, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Berta. Yes, I didn't go uh, enough into uh, voter buying. And uh, I want to, before talking about that, I want to uh, really say that I agree with everything that uh, Sasha said uh, on the opposition. I mean, it's, uh, it's a fair account on that. <laughs> analysis of uh, them in these elections, but as well, Alexandra kind of, uh, you know, gave them a, a just benefit of a doubt because, uh, I mean, it's really hard to operate in the political climate. And I'm not talking about maybe some leaders that ruled Serbia before 2012 and that are part of this coalition. You have, uh, you know, several um, parties grown out from political activists and green parties that carried the bulk of these elections. So if, you, if we talk about uh, controllers uh, such as myself, <laughs> if they weren't for these parties, there would be no control for the opposition whatsoever in these elections. So when we talk about uh, the opposition, and this is not quite popular nor po politically pragmatic to do at this point, we would have to talk about individual co segments of this coalition. And then obviously everything would break apart to the benefit of the regime. But I think this fair analysis needs to happen sometime in the future. Now about uh, electoral fraud. And Strahinja was talking about 2027. But who says, Strahinja, that we will have presidential elections and the st same constitutional framework in 2027 as we do today? I can very well see Vucic is in a problem there now, uh, but I can very well see him attempting to change the constitution to introduce a parliamentary um, uh, system whereby the president would ba basically be elected by the National Assembly and become Vucic's 
fig leaf as a prime minister and Vucic could lead as a prime minister for years to come. So, you know, 2027 becomes 2037 or 2057 or whatever, you know, and that's how long <laughs> he can live, basically. So I think there we have to talk about uh, the electoral fraud. It's not just something that you accept. You know, you I wouldn't fight with Mike Tyson. It's just like a, uh, it's a matter of choice uh, whether you enter into that political game and whether you legitimize, uh, you know, uh, such uh, a system. You know, in 2020, when the, uh, it, it's a big uh, catch-22 for the opposition. In 2020, when they boycotted the elections, Vucic didn't have a comfortable position with the Western partners. Neither the Western partners had a comfortable position in supporting an autocrat that has only one uh, out of 2,250 MPs in the parliament. That is uh, a genuine opposition, Shaib Kamberi from the Albanian minority party. That was the situation, I recall you, for 2020. So now, if we are talking about uh, what's coming forward, I would. I think it's quite legitimate to ask why should the opposition even participate in these elections and give a carte blanche to a system that is going to win whatever happens. You know, let's talk about the voters from the arena. Because like this, you know, it seems uh, quite abstract and people don't understand what's happening. Basically, you uh, and the opposition knew that this would uh, take part. Uh, you know, in the weeks before the election. It was a dilemma whether to talk about it or not. There were voices that thought, okay, you should talk about it before, but the voices against prevailed because the voices against were saying, if we start talking about that, we are creating a climate of defeatism amongst the undecided voters. And then, you know, even less of them will go out and vote because they will think that the game is lost in advance. And I, I'm starting to think after this entire day, that yes, maybe every time it will be lost in advance with this system. I mean, talking about, um, uh, it's true that the opposition didn't have, a, a, you know, a proposed, like a, a positive campaign, as Sasha said, uh, that, that's true. But how could they have a positive campaign? Who could have, who could hear this campaign? Where? Vujic's voters are unable to hear this campaign because uh, there is no access uh, to media that they have access to for the opposition politicians. So this is already for one. Uh, there is another problem, and I saw that there was one question kind of going along the ways there. Uh, uh, basically, um, you know, a big chunk of the opposition coalition would support the Ohrid agreement talking about uh, the agreement that Vucic made with Albin Kurti and is pretending that he didn't make it. Um, uh, so if they decided to support Vucic for in making an Ohrid agreement, Vucic would attack them in his maybe a, a media for supporting something that he did. So, I mean, I know this sounds crazy, but this is how it works in Serbia in this media climate. You know, I do think that they could have a more positive economic campaign, social campaign, actually proposing genuine policies, which is what they didn't have, as Sasha rightly pointed out. But then, you know, again, the question is, could Vucic's voters hear this? And um, could the other undecided voters be uh, convinced by it? I want to believe that yes. But I'm also asking myself, but how many voters are we talking about? Alexander mentioned 40 percent. I mean, this is, you know, uh, uh, it, it's a big dilemma for Serbia because many of these people live abroad for years and don't have access actually to the Serbian elections. If you live abroad in Serbia, first of all, you cannot vote for the local elections so, which is kind of logical, probably as well, uh, in the municipalities in Serbia where you come from. And that's second, when they drive you in by buses, then you can't. Exactly, and I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that to explain the fraud. So, you know, the kind of the urban uh, middle class Serbia is bigger than twenty five percent. It's just that a lot of it lives abroad. So, if these people could actually vote as the voters from Republika Srpska could 
maybe we would have different results. But uh, it's, you know, we are talking about this for a long time. CERTA, um, the organization that the only really um, independent organization that monitors these elections, they're going to come out with their uh, results estimates in 15 minutes because Ipsos and CESID are part of Vucic's operation. And I'm so I'm saying this, uh, if you want me to tell you something from the polls, basically from the polling stations, basically uh, every hour uh, SNS presidents of the polling stations or their deputies have the task to inform Ipsos and CESID about the turnout. They were using a special Ipsos and CESID application and they were also tasked in, um, in inserting the results as soon as they can, they could have had done that uh, as we were counting the results. So Ipsos and CESID are, uh, you know, completely in the service of this system that uh, we were uh, seeing in Serbia. They, their provisions probably will prove to be correct. I'm not just talking about that, but I'm just talking about how you create expectations and how you gerrymander the vote with the polls ahead of the vote. You know, in Serbia, many voters vote for the incumbent. This is not a surprise. So a lot of these people who voted for Vucic, as it was mentioned by others, voted for fear, for being part of some clientelistic network. And if they think ahead of the vote that um, this party will still remain in power they will vote for that same party if they think that uh, you know, that uh, maybe a change is possible they will not so when Ipsos comes out with uh, with some you know uh, estimates ahead of the vote it influences the results in a great manner and this is what ha happened on Thursday night um, and now on the buses, and I will stop here because I'm talking for a very long time now, and I apologize for that. Uh, well, yes, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, uh, all this system of voters from Republika Srpska voting, and we had quite a lot of the polling stations from Bosnia, you know, uh, that uh, maybe in the part of town where I was, you could have thought that they actually lived there because it's a... Uh, uh, refugees uh, uh, part of urban Belgrade where I was controlling the elections, but uh, mainly people from Croatia, not so much from Bosnia. So you had people from Bosnia all around Belgrade at the polling stations. Basically, they have a right, no Serbian citizen uh, 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 living abroad in Western Europe has. This is a discussion that resembles a lot Orban's Hungary and how it functions uh, in his elections. Basically, uh, if you live in Republic of Srpsk, normally you could vote in um, consular departments or Serbian embassy in Sarajevo, or you can come to Serbia and vote. You cannot vote in local elections in Serbia because all their um, uh, residences in Belgrade are fictitious and illegal. So when a minister of uh, security of Bosnia, and he publicly vote, uh, uh, voted in the Belgrade elections votes. When Milorad Dodik votes, they're basically showing that the Serbian state is entirely captured by Vucic's party. Normal citizen from born abroad that has acquired the Serbian citizenship doesn't have a residency in Belgrade until, uh, unless they really live in Belgrade. And if they do live in Belgrade, they have to live in Belgrade. Otherwise, what happens to many people who, you know, like Albanians in south of Serbia, if you uh, don't live on your address, they froze your address. Well, nobody frozes the address of phantom voters for the Vucic's party. So a lot of this, we can talk in pragmatic terms, what the opposition should do, uh, what, uh, you know, they did wrong. But still, I would remember the Mike Tyson metaphor and what big dilemma this poses uh, when you want to participate in such an unfair democratic game in Serbia. Thank you. Um, it's a pity because I would like to continue talking about like the fraud and like um, how um, the election went, but we only have 10 minutes and, and I really want to touch upon um, the implications um, uh, for the EU, for like Serbia's EU 
uh, accession process, if the process is still alive and, and for the region. So I would um, ask you, um, Strachinia, if you can touch upon uh, these topics uh, maybe briefly so we can also like go um, to the other panelists for some like final um, words. Sure. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk about the uh, implications for EU accession process of uh, Serbia, considering I work at the European Policy Center. Uh, well, uh, I, I know that some people in Brussels or member states might feel an inclination not to work with uh, Serbia, considering that yet again we have a person with autocratic tendencies, with a questionable uh, EU um, orientation, so on and so forth. However, it's a fact that uh, he is liked by many people here. It's a fact that uh, he uh, enjoys uh, a reliable support and that he is most likely to stay a force to be reckoned with until the end of this decade. So either we can say we don't like him and just put us aside completely and have potential consequences or try to find a compromise without compromising on democracy. So maybe that's the way to put it. I, I, I insist on this because I don't like when people look at this situation from a black and white perspective, uh, maybe particularly people from Baltics and Poland who don't like our foreign policy alignment records or people from, let's say, uh, Benelux who dislike our democracy or lack of democracy uh, standards. Because I say this, because anything both positive or negative that takes place in Serbia can have both, both positive or negative uh, effects for the entire region, if not even uh, beyond. So in that sense, uh, our organization insists on actually uh, giving Serbia a chance while keeping the process uh, merit-based. And in that sense, we, as you know, probably we have developed this uh, idea of uh, uh, gradually integrating uh, the uh, country, the candidates in the EU. We named it the model for staged accession. And therefore, we're not saying that this would change the situation on the ground, but at least you can create a favorable, a more favorable environment by, on the one hand, increasing the financial incentives, and on the other hand, to increase the possibility, institutional incentives, the possibility to have a say in EU institutions. Of course, none of the candidates currently are eligible to get those funds. So Serbia would not be able to sit at the EU table or get additional money. However, if Montenegro or Macedonia does the hard work, and if the EU shows that the EU perspective is more than just words, that it can actually allow those who deserve to go forward to actually go forward, I think this way, you could potentially incentivize our government or maybe the opposition to start talking about the EU. Because during the elections, the EU was simply not on anyone's agenda, including the opposition's agenda. Uh, the radio television of Serbia had one, uh, uh, one session on EU uh, policy, on the accession process. Everybody talked about Kosovo. So one needs to show that the enlargement policy is not a long, flat line stretches from the moment you get a candidate status or open accession talks all the way to full membership. You need to show that the process is alive, that it is dynamic. Um, In that so, sense. Just a quick question. Yeah. Do you think that the recently published growth plan for the Western Balkans is uh, matching a little bit as like on the lines of um, your proposals for um, stage accession? Uh, and one day after the growth plan was announced, the uh, Jan Herr Koppen, the head of Digineer, he said actually that the growth plan is a form of a stage accession. So they were inspired and we were glad that he said it publicly. So I'm not saying that this will change the situation on the ground completely, but it gives some sort of window of uh, opportunity, uh, if not with starting with Serbia, but maybe with other countries in the region. So the more EU showcases that the enlargement works, the more likely, not surely, but likely it is, you will create favorable environment uh, uh, for EU accession to happen. To conclude, one may argue, counter-argue, that none of this will work because EU citizen, uh, Serbian citizens are anti-EU per se. But they're skeptic, look at the polls. I would actually argue that they just got tired and, and they got dissatisfied. 
And this explains why they became hopeless. That's why the EU is simply not on anyone's uh, agenda. So if Vucic is, uh, uh, starts believing that the EU might happen, he could have the potential to change the situation on the ground. I, I'm not saying he will do it. I always need to put this uh, big <laughs> emphasis, but we, that says create some uh, opportunity. So don't give up on Serbian citizens, don't give up on Serbia, or maybe on the entire Western Balkan region uh, for, for that sake. Because even Vladimir Zelensky argues that if, if he recently stated that if you leave, not Serbia, but the region as a gray zone of Europe, you risk democratic, anti-democratic tendencies, but also rise of malign external influence. So the EU, I believe, by working with Serbia, giving it additional incentives, can also send hope to Ukrainians that the enlargement can work and that they also, their EU perspective can work. Because Ukrainians are now EU optimists, but even Ukrainian Minister of Foreign Affairs say, said, don't take EU optimism in Ukraine for granted. You need to showcase the processes in life. Thanks. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for your message. And hopefully um, this don't give up on the Western Balkans is going to be picked by by whoever has to pick it. And uh, on the same line, I would um, like to ask you, Alexandra, um, we still have a few minutes. Um, what do you think that the EU uh, should do now? So also in light of the um, the election, the result of the elections and, and moving forward, what do you think um, that the EU should should be doing? Thank you. Well, first, I think that the Ukraine is now more an example of optimism and how to proceed uh, for the Western Balkans than the other way around, which is a tragedy in itself after 20 years. Well, I think that we have to have in mind that it's 2023 and not 2013 any longer. So we know who Vucic is, where he is taking the country to and what has happened. When he became European overnight, the polls in Serbia showed a pro-EU uh, support of far above 70 percent. When he took over the state and the media and the narrative, now it's down to below 40. So this is a direct result of his state capturing and his uh, agenda and not the other way around. Giving chances and waiting after a decade of knowing and seeing what he's doing, I don't know until when we are trying to do that. This is a bit a bit, a bit like what Sergeant said, that the opposition knew that they will bring in voters, but they decided to like deny it. I think that denying realities is never good. First, people are smarter, they live the reality, and they are already being being brainwashed from, from TV and from everywhere. And uh, so I think that at least the opposition should have taken the chance to like speak openly, bluntly, and honestly. And the same goes for the EU accession. I think that we really need like a, an honest cut. Where are we? What are we talking about? Um, What's what's primarily like? Is it geopolitics now? Is it fundamental first? Are the Copenhagen criteria still in place? What about the political criteria? And already with the political criteria, Serbia would be so and so. So I think that that that's really necessary. The growth plan, if it's not merit based, but if it's poured into this corrupt system across the region, will do much more harm than 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 good. And even if not. Um, given the fact that like let, let, let's think and dream that everything is fine uh to to get to economic convergence with the eu it's too little so on the one hand it's too little to actually get to convergence on the other hand if it's poured without really clear and really restrictive things that are being then really like taken on board not somewhere just written on paper but on the reality here is the money we will have more problems and then it has been said that Vucic is actually uh, popular and his regime, and that has even been explained by some uh, respectable Western journalists. Well, we discussed resources and uh, all the resources, 700,000 uh, party members, that's 10% of the population, all public institutions, the whole social system of giving um, in favor of vo voter buying, of open voter buying, uh, 40 times on TV in 45 days. I think that th with these resources on all levels, any one of us would be popular and would have these results. So I think that it's also important to, to be clear on that, like in, uh, like in a world without all these misused public resources where the popularity would be. Thank you. 
Thank you for so much, Alexandra, and, and thank you as well for being um, really brief. I just realized we haven't um, uh, responded to the question of like what future, um, so where do you see the future links and um, relations between Belgrade and Banja Luka that um, Dragan one was po uh, posing? So I would pose this last question. Maybe if you, Sasha, want to 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 answer to it, like future um, um, relations within the Western Balkans, and, and with this we will um, close. Yeah, well... Uh... I think it's a really complicated question. I think I'm not maybe the right person for this uh, Serbian world thing. But I think that uh, all these processes are interconnected. So Serbia's EU accession, geopolitical uh, relations, and the uh, regional relations, including Republika Srpska and Serbia and Kosovo. So basically, I think that uh, the authoritarian regime of Aleksandar Vucic will have uh, two options in the coming years uh, and all depends how the west will support him if uh, the west supports Vucic and he's staying in power uh, and he becomes uh, uh, more servile in the, in the when it comes to especially Kosovo issue I think that uh, there will not be any significant increase in Republika Srpska and Serbia relations, which could be detrimental in some way. But if the EU uh, uh, cuts the support to Vucic regime, he might can go into the more radical nationalist phase of his rule. And uh, because for him, it's all power games, you know, uh, he can go both ways. Uh, I don't agree with many of the analysts who consider Serbia as some kind of Russia's puppet or something like that. I think that's so oversimplified, not accurate, and it's like some kind of exotic view of Serbia. I think Serbia is mostly a uh, pro-Western country when it comes to the institutions, uh, money, influences. Uh, the only thing Russia has is uh, you know, tradition uh, within the people and uh, the anti-Western sentiment that was boosted uh, because of the 90s war and the NATO bombing, especially. So I think that uh, if uh, whether Serbia will enter EU, I think it's the mostly question for the EU. I think that the political things are much more important than the uh, uh, alleged standards that are posed. Uh, so uh, I think that is the, the, the issue of the EU and what are their geopolitical assessments. I'm not optimistic about that as I see how the world turns. Uh, but also, I think that uh, Vucic uh, uh, is a player of uh, status quo, of the limbo, of playing all, all both sides, keeping the options open. So I think we will continue to have this, uh, this open space for several years. If something uh, uh, does not happen, something radically, especially in the Kosovo. But I think he will uh, have options open, and it, depending on the EU moves, uh, Vucic will also move. If uh, uh, the EU accession process becomes realistic, I think that Vucic will grab that opportunity to, to do that because his ego is uh, uh, quite uh, enormous and he will take that opportunity to, to enter Serbia to EU and to brag about that uh, in a way. But I think that also another issue, you, if you, you want an autocrat in the EU like Orban or some others, and that is this political thing that, that is uh, really uh, an enigmatic and a paradoxical situation where there is no really a real uh, uh, proper answers. Thank you so much. And I am really sorry we like run out of time because I would like I would have liked to touch um upon or like get uh, uh delve into issues such as like as you mentioned now, um like the role of Russia in 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 Serbia and in Serbian politics, like the issue of Kosovo um and so on but uh unfortunately it's uh one it's past one already so we'll have to close it here we'll have to come to continue the conversation in some other occasion because um as we have seen uh one hour uh hasn't been enough uh i would like to thank you all of you for agreeing to participate um for taking the time after um such a busy day uh it was yesterday um some of you not having slept um, thank you for so much for agreeing to participate, for for providing with your with your analysis, and also like thank you uh, to all our audience, to the people who join us uh, in this conversation. There were some questions we didn't have time to answer. I am 
Again, I apologize for that. Um, at the EPC, we will uh, continue to monitor the developments in Serbia and in the rest of the Western Balkans, as well as um, the EU enlargement process. So yeah, I uh, encourage uh, and invite all of you to stay um, tuned for future events and publications. I uh, wish you a great afternoon to all of you, uh, uh, a nice um, Christmas to those um, who celebrate Christmas, to the other ones, a nice uh, winter break, and see you very soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.